Hey, I'm Rob Berger. When I'm not rolling in the dough, that's right, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamins Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today's show is about negotiating. And not a moment too soon, because it's time to negotiate better conditions for those of us holed up here in the basement. Well, hang on, because better times are on the way with Maury Teherapur as she teaches us how to harness the power of connection to negotiate fearlessly. Also, are you taking care of parents and kids? Today, we'll talk to Haven Life's Brittany Burgett about a growing group of people in America, the Sandwich Generation. Sounds delicious. Of course, we'll still answer the question of a lucky listener and save time for my amazing trivia. And now, two guys who are going to cave to my negotiations like a couple of two-bit chumps. It's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. It's funny how he can read that the power of connection is the key to negotiation and then call us chumps when we're about to go to the negotiating table. Oh, you were actually going to go? I, I, w- I wasn't even going to justify this with any amount of time or energy. You're gonna just no, f- you're right. This would be kind of fun. Just going to phone it in. Oh, you know, it's going to be a circus. It's like Madagascar with the, with the monkeys and the penguins. Are, <laughs> he's like, I want paternity leave. Paternity leave? <laughs> so, How many times do you think parents have watched movies like Madagascar in the last three weeks? About 57. We are, uh, yeah, we are. We are kind of working our way through a couple of series. I'm the parent of the year. I'm getting I got well, I got the mug somewhere. It already says it. So I'm trying to re up for this year. So my kids and I are on Die Hard three. We're looking forward to Die Hard four <laughs> and five. Oh, welcome to How Not to Parent. Another Monday on the show. I'm Joe we're Salci. Running out of, we're running out of, <laughs> out of shows, man. It's like, it, you know, you got to do some series. You can't just do a single thing so it's uh that guy with the parent of the year mug whose voice you hear that is mr og we've got a great sexy og absolutely first thing on a monday morning nothing i think more than i'm looking pretty good today i showered and everything it's a monday so i showered you do you look crisp i have not showered nor shaved so uh me neither late to late to the table hey big thanks to fiverr for supporting stacking benjamins Ah, such a cool company but, and and we've been on it nonstop the last week. We're Nobody doing our, hires us, but we're on it. We're doing our part, though, America, to hire other people using Fiverr. So easy to find freelance talent for your business or product. Don't waste any more time. Get 10% off and the service you deserve by going to FIVERR.com. Use code SB. Have you seen the celebrity version of this? Celebrity version? Oh, where they'll do a birthday ogram for you or whatever. Yeah, you know, it's like a five-minute thing, and some comedian will go like, hey, it's your birthday, and you suck, or something like that. Yeah. 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 It's probably better radio if you don't chew. I got to eat, man. Got to. You make us record these at one in the morning for crying out loud. We're we're home 24-7, and you can't find a different time to chew. May I have some coffee, please? (laughs) We're Professor Maury Maury Tehirapur joining us. That's great. (sighs) Brittany Burgett, but first, OG's going to chomp through a headline, so let's get the party started. Hello, darlings. And now, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our first headline comes to us from USA Today, written by uh, Mark Phelan. Coronavirus says dealerships moving to online sales and car buying may never be the same. Did you see this? The way- no, but I was thinking about this as a strategic byproduct of the quarantining you're looking but, at so uh, many businesses that are going to change. Yeah. What's going to be more interesting to me are the businesses that were just as successful while their people were working at home that immediately turn back on the dime and go, yeah, you guys all need to come work tomorrow. Right. <laughs> Quarantine's over. Get back to work. It's like, but can I just work from home? Because w- our revenues are up as a firm because, you know, no, come back to the office. No. Just to didn't. justify that 25 year lease in the big ass building <laughs> downtown, you know? Uh, Mark writes, the way we buy cars may never be the same again. 
As car dealers adjust to working under COVID-19 restrictions and customers discover, they prefer the new approach, which leans heavily on internet sales and vehicle demos and could include valet-style pickup and delivery service for everything from test drives to oil changes. This is going to fundamentally change how people view buying a car, said Rhett Rickert, CEO of Rickert Automotive Group in Columbus, Ohio, and chairman of the National Auto Dealers Association. By the end of this year, you're going to see 80 to 90% of U.S. new car dealers with full e-commerce capabilities in their shops to handle everything online but the test drive and maybe the final signature, he said. Online deals at Rickert's domestic dealerships have doubled during the last six weeks, he said. In Michigan, Governor Gretchen Whitmer's extended stay-at-home order clears the way for that after a month when nearly all vehicle sales were prohibited in the state. It allows workers at motor vehicle dealerships who are necessary to facilitate remote and electronic sales or leases or to deliver motor vehicles to customers provided that showrooms remain closed to in-person traffic. Uh, Lots of states following guidelines like that lately. But even after this, I got to tell you, the last two vehicles, one new, one used that I purchased from dealers, Both, I would say 85% of that transaction for me was online because I'm used to working online. The negotiation was better. It was easier. It was cleaner. I could much more easily drive the price down on the car and not feel like I was taking away somebody's lunch while I did it. The nameless, faceless negotiation. Yes. you're You're such an American. I can hide behind the keyboard. You and Richard Gere. <laughs> just, just, just. It feels feels so much better to like take away somebody's commission when I don't actually have to sit across the table from them. Well, here's what I did. Man, am I awesome. Let me tell you how great I am. (laughs) Here's what I didn't do. I didn't get snarky like people will at the keyboard, right? Because people get really brave and write stupid stuff. I didn't do that. I didn't get emotional about it. I just was able to stick with the facts. And I could also walk away from the table for a while, which I can't do when I'm sitting right across the table from you sitting right there. Me going, uh, excuse me every four minutes while I think about what my next reply is just isn't going to, isn't going to work quite as well. Uh, So I kept it not emotional. I also made sure that I was not pitting me against the dealer as much as one dealer against another dealer. I I always imagine like the response in the messaging. Like I was thinking about, you know, how you could write back, you get the email that says, here's the thing. And then you're kind of mulling on how to do that. Right. And two hours later you write back, but you start out with, Hey, sorry, I was in a meeting. Um, why don't we do that? But in reality you weren't, you were just thinking about it. Could you imagine doing that in person right. where you're like sitting across the table? You're like, Oh, sorry, I've got a meeting. And you go sit out in the lobby and you just kind of sit there for two hours, have a cup of coffee and you come back in and go, sorry, I was in a meeting. Sorry. Anyways. Um, yes. Cause you had to think about strategically your reply. Yeah. That's, or, uh, or just, Oh, hold on a second. I got to take a phone call. And then you sit there thinking right in front of them. Exactly. (laughs) Or you go to the bathroom. But I think about stuff like this, not just with car deals. This will make it less painful for people, you know, who consider this, this painful. This could also drive up sales for car dealers because people, man, I got to tell you, when I started buying used cars, that was fantastic. Partly because I hate going to the car dealer. I would, yeah. I would much rather just buy a used car from Bob down the street. Much, much easier dealing with a, dealing with another Yahoo like me. The last uh, vehicle that I purchased also was done kind of electronically. You know, I, I, I did the whole internet thing. Then the person got my phone number, so we just started texting. And it took the better part of a month and a half because, you know, this was what I was looking for was a specific thing. And she couldn't find it. Oh, I can't find it. It doesn't exist. Well, that's like you said, from the other side of it, the internet works wonders. And I said, well, that's okay. I found one in North Carolina, so I'm just going to work with them. Thanks. All of a sudden, (laughs) the the heavens opened up. She was able to acquire it. It's amazing because they didn't, you know, want to lose the deal. But I do remember mentioning to her and to the finance people, you know, when you go sign up, you know, when you fill out all the paperwork, I said, listen, I don't want to talk about anything. We've decided on everything. Don't give me any surprises. I'm bringing my kid. I have 15 minutes. I want to go in. I need to sign whatever I got to sign. I want the keys. I want to leave. I don't need an introduction to the vehicle. I don't need you to walk me through the, how any lock brakes work. I just want the keys. I want to sign whatever I got to sign and I want to leave. It still took an hour. Didn't it? No, it it didn't. It was probably about a half hour, but it wasn't as long as it could have been. And the guy was really cool. He's like, Hey, I understand you've already got this all figured out. I'm like, well, I don't have it figured out, but I don't have any time. He's like, all right, cool. Sign here. 
you know, I still read everything. I did find it irritating, though, that my car alerted the dealership that it was time for service. And the guy texted me like two weeks ago. Hey, your car's ready for a service. Uh, would you like to drop it off? I thought it was an automated response, you know, like one of those bots. So I just wrote back, um, no, Corona. And, and then he wrote back, ha ha, yeah, I understand. We can come pick it up if you want. And then I thought, well, that's even worse. Now I've got other people in my car. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've been, but where am I going? I'm not going anywhere. So I don't need, I don't need oil service right now. But um, you know what I hope happens with the car dealership stuff? I hope that everybody realizes that brand new cars are stupid. And they just buy used ones from now on. All the time. Yeah. Somebody's got to buy the new car to have a used car. That's the oh, son of a biscuit. There's got to be one sucker in every group. Is that what you're saying? The definition. Be somebody who does it incorrectly. The definition of a used car is that somebody has to, has to uh, go into the car dealership. Your logic is amazing. And, and well, I hope there's some people that buy new cars. Then. You and I have seen a couple times in the last. 20, 25 years when, when it skews so much toward used cars that the new car deal becomes fantastic. I mean, don't get me wrong. Those are slivers in the entire horizon. Well, I mean, it's kind of, of notwithstanding the cash flow of it, which, and it's the thing I hate most about debt isn't the interest rate. I hate the cash flow. I hate the fact that I've got this payment that I got to deal with. You know what I mean? And you talk about like financial independence and, and being able to, change your lifestyle and work around things. And, you know, we get things that are happening that are good or not so good that I don't necessarily mind the interest rate because I get how that whole cost of capital thing's got to work, but I mind the cash flow. And when I see the things like, Hey, you can buy this brand new car for 0% for 84 months. That's actually not a terrible deal from an interest rate standpoint, right? 0% interest. And you've got the, but the whole premise of the payment for freaking seven years <laughs> and the thing's worth like half as soon as you get it. Yeah. You know, it's just like day one, you've got four years of payments to make before you get back to walking out of that thing. Even money. It just, it's just a hard pill to swallow. So I'm with you. I'm on team used car plan. And in our second headline, a new study out from Haven life talks about this idea of the sandwich generation and the fact that you've got some people out there who are being hit from both sides. Obviously, right now with the coronavirus outbreak, uh, we're being hit from all sides. But when this is over, we still have some of these same issues. And here to talk about it on my dad's shortwave is my friend Brittany Burgett. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Joe? I'm, I'm Well, I'm good, you know, in the basement as usual. Hopefully, you and yours are feeling healthy right now. Yes. I feel very fortunate right now, but I also will take any excuse to be socially distant. So I'm sure <laughs> like you can relate to, it's <laughs> not so bad. You're one of those people who've been preparing for this your whole life, right? Oh yeah. I've been training my entire life. Yeah. Well, let's talk about this, your piece about this called what is the sandwich generation and what does it want uh, written by Nicole Decker. Uh, we'll link to it in our show notes starts off and says, John Latona, general manager at Haven life knows all about the worry his father just turned 91. His mother's in her late 80s. While both parents still live independently, Latona says, I'm just waiting for the call. Latona and his wife have two children, both under five years old. And every few months, they make the 10-hour trip to visit his parents and ensure everyone's doing okay. But even this arrangement won't be viable long term. There's going to be a point where my parents need more help. You guys dove into this, Brittany. I guess my first question is, why Haven Life talking about the sandwich generation? Yeah, it's something that many members of our team think about a lot. And we found that many of our team members are also going through the same life stages that our customers are going through. Haven Life was founded by Jerome when he had his first child and needed to get life insurance. And I think similarly, the team is pretty aware of what's going on in the lives of the types of people that we help financially protect. And so this was a subject that we were pretty curious about and we're excited to kind of delve more into as a result of just the understanding on our team. It says in the piece, the Pew Research Center reports that as of 2013, nearly half of adults in their 40s or 50s at a parent age 65 or older and were simultaneously either raising a young child or helping a grown child financially. Roughly 15% of middle-aged adults were providing financial support to both 
Let's talk about people that are in the sandwich generation. Tell me what you found out. Yeah, so I guess first I'll start with when we were surveying the adults, um, we asked specifically if they identified as being part of the sandwich generation and defined it. And so those are people who have young children in their house and are either providing decision-making support or financial support to aging parents. So really it's people who are sandwiched between two really substantial responsibilities in their lives. Some of the things that stood out to us when we were reading it were some of the figures around their financial situation as a result of it. I mean, we got a lot of really interesting insight about lifestyles as well, but I think especially with what's going on economically right now, that's part of the survey that stands out most to me. And the big key finding is that the sandwich generation, even compared to, you know, other tour generations, when you look at either millennials or baby boomers, but they're really struggling to save for retirement. One of the interesting insights that we found was that 84% of the respondents indicated that their retirement will be negative impacted by their financial responsibilities in some way. And so that's either having to adjust their retirement goals or they feel like they won't retire at all. And so that stood out to me as probably one of the most substantial findings that these responsibilities to young children as well as their aging parents are ultimately affecting how they'll retire down the road. I found something else interesting too, Brittany, which is that uh, I've been having a lot of talk with people lately about their mental health, people checking in mm -hmm. with each other saying, hey, you doing okay? A lot of people, unlike you or I, <laughs> not as used to you and I as working from home, a lot of people having issues in the sandwich generation with their mental health. This is difficult, not for a month or two months like it is for healthy Americans right now. This is a long-term mental hurt that's not going to go away anytime soon. Yes, exactly. So a lot of the findings around just their personal health as a result of this, whether this be physical or mental, um, were pretty concerning. So I think, you know, starting at the top, we found that about 80% of the respondents feel overwhelmed often or constantly. And so we decided to dive a little bit deeper and figure out like, how often does that really mean? And of the people who indicated that they were overwhelmed, they stated that they were overwhelmed about five days out of seven days per week. I think the other finding that kind of leads to understanding why perhaps their mental health is being affected by being a member of the sandwich generation is the survey respondents who indicated being very overwhelmed were also the ones who were most likely to be seeing negative financial impacts mm. as a result of their responsibilities. So negative financial impacts being them saying that they're worried about their financial health as a result of their responsibilities or the individuals who indicated that they've had to adjust their retirement goals or worry that they will never retire. Those are the ones who are most likely also to be feeling overwhelmed and, you know, their mental health seem to be being affected by that. Yeah, I can imagine. I'm looking at uh, a piece of the study that shows how the sandwich generation would spend an extra hour in their day. 50% of them say sleep. 48% say they'd spend time with children. 48% would spend time with their partner. 41% say exercise. Like these are all healthy activities that they're not having enough of. Is that the big takeaway? Is that this is really hurting their own ability to retire when they have to take care of kids and parents, Brittany? Or is there another takeaway as well? You know, I think the other takeaway is just this constant reminder that when you are a parent um, and when you have these kind of substantial responsibilities, especially, you know, in a time like what we're going through right now, how important it is to take time for yourself one of the things that Nicole included in her write-up of the research, which I thought was really excellent and insightful, was she spoke to a licensed marriage and family therapist in San Diego named Kim Eagle. She was providing insights into, you know, how there really are consequences for not taking time to take care of yourself. And if you're able to take care of yourself, you're going to be able to better take care of everyone else. You hear the same thing when you think about your financial situation. Mary Beth Georgehan, who's also quoted in this article, I've, I've read her say plenty of times where you always have to put on your oxygen mask before you help out someone else. And I think that's the underlying thread in all of this is that 
it's very clear the sandwich generation has an overwhelming amount of responsibilities, both personally and financially, but they can't forget how important it is to take care of themselves. Well, great takeaways, and we'll link to it on our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com if people want to dive in more. Brittany, thanks for hanging out with us for a few minutes and uh, <laughs> taking t- I would say taking time out of your busy day, but we're all at home <laughs> binging Netflix. So thanks for taking some time yeah, with us. Yeah, I've just been sitting around waiting for your phone call. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Nothing going on, right? No, thank you for having me. Big thanks to Brittany for stopping by. Nobody's helped out, OG, if you don't take care of yourself first. I agree. Got to take care of you, which is why you always, when you get those donuts, you let your kids watch you eating them, don't you? Make a big donut tower, put chocolate all over them. Like, guys, hold on. Let me show you how to do this. To gather the kids around. No, no, no. You can't mm-hmm. have any. These are for dad. Exactly. Take care of myself first. That's take care uh, of me. probably lesson number one. Lesson number two is the world's a change in. Maybe uh, it's a great time to be thinking about where the ball's headed and uh, see how much you can take advantage of that. Maury Teherapur is one of the most interesting people I've ever met. She teaches at this little school called the Wharton School. Don't know if you've heard of that, OG, at the University of Pennsylvania. She's worked with clients like UPS, Wells Fargo, and the NFLPA, NFL Players Association, on negotiating successfully. And where a lot of people talk about the tactics of negotiation, people like Chris Voss is an example, fantastic, talking about tactics. Maury is much more of a holistic negotiator. How do we come to the table at first? And I think we're going to really enjoy ourselves and learn a little bit about whether you're negotiating for the TV remote while you're sitting at home or negotiating (laughs) for your next raise or maybe negotiating to continue working from home. Maury Teherapur on My Dad Shortwave. And on My Dad Shortwave... Our new friend Maury Teherapur. How are you? Hi, how are you? Thank you for having me. Well, I'm I'm glad that you're here with us. And especially in these weird times, you know, you and I were talking before we started recording about just how weird it is. Like I had to go get a package and, and I spend half an hour washing myself off, which is why we're starting this a little late. Right. At least I'm happy that we're all kind of crazy about this because that is like self-preservation and it's good for us, but there is no such thing as efficiency anymore. It's like just every form of wipe and cleaner and, you know, mind you, my hands, thank God I don't even have to get manicures anymore because they're just, you know, I'm glad nobody can see them, but it's like manual labor. That's what I do. Uh, But it's crazy. So being an expert in negotiation, I'm wondering now that everybody's at home, Maury, if, if you then are using your skills to better negotiate, like which Netflix we watch next, what we have for dinner next. Like I bet everybody just kind of bends because you're the ninja at this. Except for the fact that the ninja lives alone. So the only person I negotiate with is Alexa. And she often listens to me, but not always. It's not the always. went on, actually, as I said that. You know, it's funny. The fact that I do live alone means that I don't have to negotiate for things like space and what show I'm going to watch or what have you. But I'm so much more in my head. So yeah. I talk about that in my book. Like the Usually, the biggest decisions I make, the most sort of difficult conversations I have are with myself anyway, you know, make going through some kind of turmoil or deciding on a certain client or what have you. But now it's like that times a hundred because I'm, I'm in my head all the time. Should I do this? How should I prioritize the work? Should I go after this type of a client? I've never done online teaching before, which, you know, and it's sort of like the music that's playing in your head constantly. That's negotiations. I'm constantly making some kind of decision about, what that day is going to look like, because this is all, you know, we've never been here before. So when it comes to negotiating Netflix, you're having this internal battle about which way do I go, which, which I think sometimes is even worse. It can drive you batty. It really can, because you overthink things. I'm not, 
I'm sleeping less at night because I am yeah. in my head. I mean, I that's think, sort of the danger of all this. Uh, oh, me too. I think that's a ton of us. And I found myself that by serving our community and focusing on that, I find that mm-hmm. helps me sleep better. Like get out of my own space and into, into right. somewhere else. But I want to ask you this because I'm very curious about how somebody gets interested in negotiating. Like I'm imagining you, Maury, at 16 years old, being totally ripped off by a used car salesperson, right? And going, you know what? I got to be better. But I'm sure that's not the real story. How do you get interested in negotiation? I didn't even know that this is where I was supposed to be. So I'm not one of those people that said, oh, when I was four, I wanted to be a negotiations professor at some point in my life. So that's not how it happened. And I was sort of asked to teach when I was actually at Wharton by one of my professors. But what I came to realize was that life is a negotiation. And so this may be the most practical skill that we can gain and be better at because we're doing it all the time, every day, all day. So I think you have to at some point realize that this isn't the being ripped off by a by a used car salesman or the, you know, those like horrific transactions that you're like, I know I should have asked for more, right? Like that's not what negotiations. That's just this tiny sliver of a negotiations. What what we do every single day in our daily capacity. Uh, and like I said, I, I do it with myself, but you know, your dog who doesn't want to come in, even though it's like hailing outside or, you know, the kid that doesn't want to go to sleep when you want them to go to sleep. All of these are the conversations that we have all day, every day. And so I thought this is an extraordinary opportunity for me to being able to play a role in something that people do every day. If I could just even contribute a little bit to making those conversations more meaningful to make them less about sort of in the moment what you get, but really sort of these long-term, whether it be relationships or business in perpetuity, but, you know, sort of creating value out of these opportunities is what I really became passionate about. I think that's fascinating how people misinterpret just the idea of negotiation. I'm wondering as you're talking, that's one misconception. What are some Mm -hmm. other misconceptions people have about skillful negotiating? that they have to be something that they're not. I mean, I think we, I think the word winning is one that we've sort Mm. of mistaken anyway. You know, you have all these things associated with the word winning, which never is used in my classroom, by the way, because oftentimes, first of all, it's got sort of these inherently masculine attributes associated with it, right? It's like crushing the opponent, like you win, they must lose. And the sort of power and leverage, like those are all the words that are oftentimes associated with the word winning. Whereas you know, you have to redefine what that really means. So I think that's one place to start is what is it that you really want to get out of this conversation? If it's just a one-time thing, that's actually not as hard, but, you know, extracting long-term value, changing these conversations from short-term to sort of indelible opportunities. That's one thing that I don't think we think enough about and sort of redefining winning. You know, you can, by any measure, get some great quantitatively strong outcome out of a negotiation. But if the person who just negotiated with you thinks, I never want to see this person again, you know, here, take it. I never want to talk to you. Was that really winning? You know, how good do you feel about yourself? So, you know, redefining that. And I think there's a cultural thing. The other piece of it is that um, sort of following that logic When we think about sort of you overpowering somebody, we think about somebody who's aggressive. We think about somebody who's sort of bullying or, you know, yelling and that whole, all those sort of characteristics where, you know, if you think about it, do you enjoy negotiating with somebody like that? I certainly don't. And because of that, there are people who are oftentimes quite kind, right? They have a lot of integrity. They have sort of, they value relationships. They're empathetic. Well, I kind of prefer that person. And all this is just logical. Like, who would you rather have a conversation with? And so if we put more emphasis on those things and held them up as the winning personality, the curious person who wants to learn, the person who is empathetic and wants to step into your shoes to understand how you got here to this conversation today, and you think, that's what I prefer. That's the person I want to have a conversation with. That's who I want to negotiate with. Then I think we could step back and say, yeah, all those all those things we had in our minds about what made it for a good negotiator, we were probably wrong. We were probably wrong. Be yourself. We hear about these bulldog negotiators all the time. You mentioned one guy, uh, Drew Rosenhaus, is an example. Mm-hmm. Bulldog negotiator. I read his uh, memoir where he talks about basically getting everything he wants for his clients. 
but the way that you just presented that makes me think that some of the most skilled negotiators are people we don't even see as negotiators. I would think that Maury that like there's, it's so sublime that maybe they don't even know that it's a great negotiation. Right. And don't get me wrong. I mean, Drew Rosenhaus is great for who he is. I think he's authentically himself. He is who he is and that's what he brings to the table. And it appeals to certain people. The opposite side of that was like the Bob Wolfs of the world. Also a great sports agent, right? And his whole thing was leave something on the table. And this isn't about a short-term thing. This is going to be a long-term thing. If I'm going to see this GM from this club over and over again, I want him to remember me in a good way, not a bad way. So I don't have to work so hard every single time we negotiate. So, you know, they're all opposite sides of that spectrum. And then there's a lot of people right in the middle. So I think that we oftentimes don't get the examples of great negotiators as much as we do these sort of bullying types, because it's sort of sexier to watch on in movies and on TV. But the Nelson Mandela's of the world, the people who through very peaceful, respectful conversation have change the world we live in, those are great negotiators too. And we don't think of them as such. I had a a mentor one time tell me that every discussion is a cube and the person who sees the other person's side of the cube first is going to do a better job because you're understanding the other person first. You were presented with that and you, you tell a great story at the beginning of your book, how early in your career you were helping people, I believe it was in the Bay Area, deal with Mm -hmm. HIV. And you were talking to some like a young kid who wasn't using condoms. Do you mind telling that story? Because I think this is a powerful negotiation. Sure. I was young. Um, I just was just having graduated college and I moved out to the Bay Area and I wanted to do something in public health and volunteered for this organization. And we served um, really high risk individuals. So prostitutes, drug users, injection drug users, people who are putting themselves at risk through their lifestyles. And we were doing heavy testing and I was doing the counseling. I met this young man who not only was I trying to teach him about safer sex practices, but also just better understanding who they are. And then we would counsel them in order to get tested. You know, I was just talking and he said, so this like AIDS, HIV thing, how long before it kills you? And like that question alone sort of took me back because I was like, um, wasn't expecting that. I thought he'd talk about all the things I was talking to him about. And I said, well, you know, we're just learning more and more about this, which we were at the time. And I said, you know, it could be anywhere from when, once you get diagnosed, five to seven years, we we're just getting these early treatments. And he said, five to seven years, that's a really long time. You know, I could come out of my house tomorrow and be shot. You know, so if I can live five to seven years in my head, that's a long time. Talk about a ton of bricks just hitting you. First of all, I was speechless at that moment. Then I realized, oh my God, how much I've taken for granted about people's lives. Everybody's journeys are so completely different. And, you know, negotiations is nothing if not about persuasion, right? So For me to have been able to persuade this young man, I had to understand his journey. I had to know how he perceived the information I was giving him, how he was receiving it. And it was completely ineffective because I'm like, oh, I'm thinking you want to live forever. And he's thinking seven years is forever, maybe. And we take that for granted. I think I learned really early on from that moment that, first of all, we can't judge and we bring in all kinds of biases with us in conversations. But you are an expert negotiator, if there is such a thing, when you actually think, I have so much to learn. So I'm going to use this conversation, open my my mind, open my heart, and really understand this person better. So that when I do want them to see my perspective, I know how to deliver that information in a way that they can see it, not the way I intended it to be seen. You've got this young man's world you're trying to get into, and you used the word uh, masculine uh, earlier in our conversation when you were talking about, you know, some of the heavy uh, Mm -hmm. negotiating techniques, right? More of a bullying type technique. Are there different ways that women and men negotiate? Is there gender specific things or is it much more individual than that? I mean, research shows that there is, but it's also important for us to know that it's not like a negotiation gene that men have and women (laughs) don't, right? right? Like it's not carried on the Y chromosome. (laughs) Like that's not it. I say that because I don't want that to be the thing that sort of handicaps people, right? Like that immediately sort of counts them out because they think I'm a woman, thus I can't negotiate well because research also shows that's not true. But I do think that there are certain generalities about the two 
genders that make them, I don't want to say one's a better negotiator and one is not, because we've clearly seen examples of both. But I do think that women tend to be much more focused on relationships, much more focused on problem solving, high degrees of emotional intelligence. Now, I know plenty of women who are none of those things, but I'm just speaking sort of in general terms. Yeah. That is sort of the, the feminine traits that we think about and, and the power that I think women have that they often don't call upon um, because they're so used to thinking, I'm not good at this, or I don't want to necessarily negotiate. What will they think of me? And then on the other side of it, men, you know, a lot of men are very clear about their goals. Men, more important than anything else, don't need permission to negotiate. They tend to think of everything as a negotiation. So just that and recognizing opportunity is opportunity and not waiting for somebody to give you permission is probably the most important thing. Because a lot of times where we fail as women is that we sort of have to be told, oh, and by the way, this is negotiable. And then we negotiate. So just coming to the table is everything, actually. It's the biggest part of the battle. Well, and speaking of that, I'm a guy who feels like in a negotiation, I'm usually a pushover. So maybe I'm maybe I'm more of the feminine side there. I don't see life as a negotiation. You tell me to pay X or you tell me it's going to be a certain way. I just, I, I, I kind of do that. Uh, what do you say to people that say that, Maury, that, oh, I'm a horrible negotiator? Well, people use different reasons for that, right? So you say you're a pushover. I mean, I, I, in the book, I talk a lot about people pleasers. That's me. Mm-hmm. The unfortunate thing about people pleasers is that they often think that negotiation is inherently conflict ridden. So because of that, and not a lot of people like conflict, they want to just avoid it. So what's the easiest route is just to sort of give and avoid that conversation altogether. The problem is, like I said earlier, negotiation is not necessarily conflict ridden, right? It's it's a conversation. And so you do this over and over and over again, especially with family and friends, I think you start really resenting them, even though you're the one who made the decision to give because nobody tells you what you're not willing to give. You start resenting that person and thus the relationship. So the very relationship you were trying to protect, you actually hurt because you weren't speaking your truth and showing up into this conversation with your needs and your wants, right? So that may be the thing that is most detrimental is just not saying, you know what, my, my needs and my wants are equally as important, but it doesn't mean that the two of us can't coexist in this conversation. It doesn't have to be one at the expense of the other. We can problem solve and make this mutually ex- inclusive opportunity for both of us. I'm fascinated by how you go about this too. You, you talk a lot about how we downplay our own stories and how much we tell these stories. You talk about being in your head, Maury. A lot of this is between our ears and and changing that story around is so important. Talk to that for a moment, if you don't mind. It's probably one of my favorite things to talk about because I live it. I live so much of that. You know, it's from how we were raised with the experiences that we have, the scars we carry. Just think about when somebody gives you a compliment. So many of us struggle with just saying thank you, right? And just receiving it. Meanwhile, I get like one not so great evaluation from a student. Forget the 44 (laughs) other really like stellar ones. I'm losing sleep for three weeks trying to figure out who it was and why and why did I not do this better? And that becomes your narrative. Think about how how hard not only is that on your your mental health, your spiritual, emotional well-being, but instead of thinking, oh, I'm going to learn from this, we'll move on, look at all the other great things I did. Now that becomes so much a part of you that failure becomes something you're really afraid of instead of saying, I'm just going to learn from this, that you start diminishing your own value because that's what you start believing, not the 44 great you know, comments. When we realize that we have the power to write our story, we have the power to believe in the narrative that we tell ourselves, I think that is the the profound change that we have to go through in order to realize where our power actually is in the negotiation, because it is the story. And if you don't believe your own story, how are you going to convince somebody else, right? If you don't believe that you have value, how are you going to convince somebody else that you do? So I think storytelling is, is incredibly important. And, you know, we tend to like, like I said in the book, like the Friday, the 13th versions, as opposed to the ones with a good ending, like somehow that's just where we go. An interesting offshoot of that is in my business, especially in financial media, you always have people saying that 
I should work for experience, right? I should work for, Hey, I'll, I'll give you a chance to be on my platform and, and it, it, you know, uh, I will work with you and you'll be paid nothing. You said that when people want to work with you at Wharton, that you say, no, 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 no. If you aren't getting paid, then you don't understand your own worth and, and you're worth more than that. This is a, I think a really important point for people that working for free is downplaying your narrative still. Yeah. And I, I do get that. I had students that have said, Oh, professor, Terry, I just want to be able to work with you. I, I, I so enjoy your class. I think it's a great experience. I'm like, well, you can still get that experience and make some money because I need you to appreciate what you're bringing to the table for me. Like the value that you're providing for me is worth something to me. I want them to learn that early on because again, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I, unfortunately, I don't walk around the streets and people are like, you know, what, Maury, we want to work with you, but you don't charge us nearly enough as much as you should. Like, who says that? Right. Oh, your, your pricing is so low, right? We don't ever hear that. It's always the opposite. So I want my students early on. I want people to understand, again, it starts with yourself, to know that you are bringing value and that value is worth something. Now, are there times where you will just work for the experience? Sure. I mean, sports industry is a great example of that. There's people that just for the experience will do anything just to, you know, get their foot in the door. That's fine. But you have to have clarity about what that really means and what you're going to extract from it. And that that becomes a moment in time that doesn't become then the entirety of your professional experience. It's just you are very clear as what you're gaining and what you're giving up. And then you go on then to leverage that experience to make more money and, and bring more value to the table. But I think we have to put limitations on it and we have to know we're worth something. I think that's what's important. The book is called Bring Yourself, How to Harness the Power of Connection to Negotiate Fearlessly. Is that the biggest takeaway, do you think, in the book? I mean, there's so many things in here, and we're not going to obviously summarize everything in 20 minutes. There's phenomenal stories. There are phenomenal tactics. There's great, even talking to you today, I think about how important it is not just to tell my narrative, but maybe to write this stuff down and have some quiet mm-hmm. time about what I'm bringing to the table before I'm in a serious negotiation. I also think about people negotiating pay raises and how mm-hmm. much this plays into them. But if there is a single big idea, what do you think that would be? Oh, single big idea. I think that's why I said that the book should be called Bring Yourself, because I do think it all starts with us. It starts with us when we're preparing. And we don't often think about that. Like we often, it's easy for us to say, what do I want to buy this car for? What do I want to pay for this house? But if you step back, even before that, you think, who am I? what's my, where are my values? Where is, where is it that I'll draw the line in the sand that I can't cross that I can't give up in the course of this conversation? Because if I do, then, then there's no way I'll consider this an opportunity that I gained from, you know, where's my integrity? How do I want to treat this person? How do I want people to remember me? All of that should be done as part of your preparation, because you don't want to regret those things after the negotiation is done. It's those very things that you can't sort of let go of later. That regret is, it just weighs on you. So it starts with you and then everything else kind of leads from there. You know, what are your goals? What kind of outcomes do you want to achieve? Not from this negotiation, but when you put this negotiation as a bigger part of your, your story and your journey and your experience, you know, how do you want people to treat you? I mean, that's a part of it too. Where is it that you can't end up working for this individual because your, your integrity is no longer intact? who are you authentically? If you're kind, then lead with kindness. Like that's who you are. You shouldn't have to be somebody else. And I think when we're ourselves, when we're authentic, when we're so clear about that, which makes us who we are, then I think that's pretty much fail safe because at that point, the outcome doesn't matter as much, right? Like, yeah, you could have done better, but you didn't give up what's most important, which is things like your values and your morals and your, your ideals. To me, you can't compromise those things. And that's why it's so important. We'll link to Bring Yourself into Maury's website on our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. Maury Tarapur, thanks for hanging out with us for a few minutes and talking about negotiation. I appreciate it. Thank you. This was so much fun. I appreciate it. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. You know, and thanks to Maury, I am feeling absolutely 100% fearless right now. It's time to negotiate with these guys and take what I got coming to me. 
So let me just let's see. What do, what do I have coming to me? Oh, okay. All right. Maury said, bring yourself. Well, I am doing just that, obvs. I mean, as the star of this operation, I'm always here. And I've got some simple demands. I don't want to do this, but cross me and neighbor Doug's all walking. And probably to one of my many podcast suitors that I have many many requests from hey check this out live from jill schlesinger's basement it's jill on money gotta admit it's got a ring to it right am i right so to keep me here i'm gonna require a a makeup artist that's right a makeup artist to look fresh three days a week second due to the current corona Apocalypse, or whatever they're calling it this week. I think it's time for my own trailer out back so I can prepare my genius in private. Uh, it's you're supposed to have three demands, I think. So, hmm, what third, third demand, third demand? Uh, 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 all right, right. Okay, I, I gotta have one that's gonna be a throwaway. I can't come up with it right now. So, while I think about that, you chew on today's trivia. Man, I wish I could demand that baseball was back. I miss that sport so much. But baseball trivia is going to have to do. So on this date in history, back in 1912, two major baseball parks opened. One housed Joe's hometown team. Oh, for God's sakes, Joe, could you have made this any easier? Uh, And the other was cursed by the babe. Oh, come on. This is like, you don't even have to know baseball to get this. Jeez, oh, Pete. Uh, Naming the parks might be hard. Not. But how about this? Name the teams. Oh, come on. This is supposed to be baseball, not softball. Got to be the easiest trivia of the year right here. I'm so happy that we get to talk about Fiverr on the show. Heck, we talk about Fiverr even without them supporting, supporting the show. But Fiverr is a place where when we need to plug in some talent right now, we don't need them long term. We just need this one specific task done. It's so much easier for a little company like Stacking Benjamins OG to compete when we don't have to go hire somebody. We just hire for that one role. And I think a lot of small businesses can learn from that. It's the wave of the future. Yeah. Gig I th- economy. I th- it, it totally is. You know, it's funny. I remember in 2000, management guru Tom Peters talking about brand you and talking about how this trend of people working for at that time, I think three different companies during their career was a big thing. And what are we up to now? Five companies people work for on average during their career. Uh, It is all about brand you. And so learning how to run a company where you can now get best in class talent and nobody's thinking long-term, they're all thinking about how do we make this one project as good as it can be really frees you up so that you can make the best possible outcome from whatever it is you're doing. I'm not looking for Mr. Right. I'm looking for Mr. Right now. (laughs) Do you put that in your Fiverr ad? I do. Let's talk about finding freelance talent for your business or project, though. Sometimes a business needs to quickly pivot in order to meet a goal, or maybe an unexpected obstacle occurs, making it impossible to meet your deadline with the size of your current team. So where do you go to find on-demand talent? How much will it cost? How can you be certain they'll deliver? Finding the right freelancer can be time-consuming, frustrating, and expensive. So whether you're launching your first business, scaling your current business, or in need of extra support to complete a project, Fiverr is here to help you evolve, adapt, and grow. Fiverr connects businesses with freelancers who offer hundreds of digital services, including graphic design, copywriting, web programming, film editing, and more. You can find whatever you're looking for right now. You can search it by service, deadline, price, reviews, and more, and you'll know exactly what you're paying for up front. No negotiating needed, 24-7 customer service, quality talent you can count on, sellers who work with some of the most influential brands in the world. Heck, we just hired somebody, OG, who uh, worked with British Airways before they worked with Stacking Benjamins. I'm getting the same voice talent that British Airways gets. How cool is that? Finding talent has never been easier. You can review seller ratings, buyer feedback, and select the right freelancer based on your budget. So check out Fiverr today and receive 10% off your first order by using code SBSTACKERS. That's code SB. It's so easy. Find all the digital services you need in one place at FIVERR.com, code SB. Again, that's Fiverr.com, code SB. Hey, 
Hey, trivia fans, it's your pal, Neighbor Doug, and I'm giving a master class today illustrating how to make great demands during a negotiation. Yeah, I'm doing who knows how much out of the box thinking is happening right here. So creative. So here's my final demand for the guys. After I secure my makeup artist, my trailer, then I'm going to need a fully stocked fridge. By stocked, I mean a bunch of mini weenies, maybe some Pillsbury dough, and like all the Kool-Aid a guy could drink. And not in powder form, I want it pre-mixed. This body's a temple. And if this Doug character is going to work, I got to be well-fed and well-hydrated like one of the nation's top athletes. Okay, time to go make my case. But first, I'll be the gracious gentleman you expect and drop off your trivia answer. The incredibly easy question, Joe was this, on this date in history back in 1912, two Major League Baseball parks opened. One was Joe's hometown team and the other was cursed by the Babe. Can you name both teams they housed? If you guessed Joe's very own Detroit Tigers and the Boston Red Sox, then you'd be right. And also, like, have ever watched a baseball game ever in your life? The parks might be harder though. For the extra credit, if you guessed Fenway Park, probably easier because it's still actually open you're halfway there and if you said tiger stadium you'd have hit a home run but you really would have scored a grand slam if you knew that tiger stadium when it was originally opened was called naven field now that would impress me and that's hard to do so now just like the tigers and the Sox left their mark on history so will neighbor doug here today in this crucial negotiation wish me luck See ya. So does he know that he gets up out of the chair and I'm standing right behind him the whole time? Does he have any idea? <laughs> I don't think so. I, I don't think so at all. Big thanks to Maury for stopping by. You know, I love this idea, OG, of thinking about not just what you're negotiating for, but who you're negotiating with. Like when you think from that person's point of view, what do they want? Yeah. What's a win? Think win-win. Yeah. Yeah. But without using the cheesy sales language. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to think outside the box here, create a solution that's win-win when we all synergize, come together, circle back. Circle back and tell me if this is a great idea. Uh, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline OG and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. Well, today is April 20th. So some people value different things on April 20th. They probably do. It says here your loved ones and your time, no matter what day it is. Well, that's true too. I bet some people now are appreciating their loved ones a little less than they might have three weeks ago. I don't know. I like my kids. Or maybe my family. Maybe a little more. It's why they made buying quality term life insurance simple so you can spend more time with them. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now for a free quote. That's stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life. Today, I want to answer a question, OG. We'll take a break from the actual call in line and answer a question. We've been getting some coronavirus questions over on Instagram. Gertrude's been posting those on our Instagram account, we've had some very serious questions that maybe a lot of people don't know the answer to. And don't get me wrong. I think most of the questions we get here are are pretty serious, but here's a big one from Adrian. If we were on unemployment prior to COVID-19, are there, they going to be getting the $600 additional week for unemployment? And if so, when? Whew, that's a tight question. This is going to be a state-by-state decision, I'm guessing, because of the uh, the kind of nature of how unemployment works. I don't know, Joe, do you have, do you have more information on this one? Yeah, uh, we actually did a lot of digging uh, for Adrian when she first asked this. So big thanks, by the way, to Kevin on our team who did some research for us. This is definitely, OG, oh, you're right there, a state-by-state basis. Many more people are eligible, so you're going to have to check whether you're eligible for the increased uh, amount of money. As an example, some gig economy workers now eligible. Some people that didn't qualify before for unemployment benefits now eligible. So the line's been moved, still not 100%. So you're going to have to check with your state. But 
It's retroactive as of uh, March 29th. Most states should have it OG rolled out by today is my understanding, but possibly not all. So if you haven't seen an increase in your unemployment, might be a good time to contact your state's unemployment office and find out what the situation is there. I would call early in the morning. Very, very early. I know here in Michigan, uh, we tried to help a family member uh, file for unemployment when this first hits. He works in food services in a restaurant situation and like most people in restaurants, unfortunately, nearly immediately was out of a job. So we had to try OG three times before we finally got through. Big thanks to Adrian for that question. You got a question for us? If it's related to this situation, we will definitely move those to the head of the class, but we're taking all questions here. Uh, StackyBenjamins.com forward slash voicemail for the Haven Lifeline. So if you have a question or you want to bounce something off of a couple of yahoos who do a podcast, StackyBenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. If you're somebody who's looking to hire a team that's better in your corner, OG and his team, of course, are taking clients. And uh, I think like a lot of people, you might be reevaluating your team right now. I'm watching, well, I'm pretty much watching all of Netflix. So if you ask me if I've watched- <laughs> You've seen it all. Yeah, the answer is yes, I'm watching it. But I'm watching a documentary about Formula One drivers called Formula One Drive to Survive. And you look at how OG, these teams that aren't performing- always looking at the quality of their team. And uh, I'm on episode six and I'm watching uh, an episode just now where two guys got fired. Time to reevaluate the team. Things not going the way you want. Is it the conditions or is it the quality of your team? Also, big thanks to people who have given us a review of the show. In fact, I want to thank somebody who just reviewed our YouTube chat with Scott Heiser, the author of Healthcare's Making Me Sick. Big thanks to Brian for his comment over there. Thoroughly enjoyed the interview with Scott Heiser. He said he was first introduced to Scott's work from his interview on Stacky Benjamins in December and immediately purchased the book. It allowed me to see healthcare and health insurance from a different light. As a result, I have a better understanding of our complex health system. In addition, I was able to take advantage of perks in my current plan that I was not familiar with prior to that. Big thanks to Brian for that comment. Just what we like to hear, OG. Helping people either save a little more, make a little more. Today's show, negotiate a little better. Spend a little more. Sp Wait, <laughs> what? <laughs> Good time to tune back in. All right, that's going to do it for today. Uh, Doug, you've got it from here, man. Maybe for the last time because... You are the weakest link. We're sitting Goodbye. out at the negotiation table. What should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, worried about your parents and kids? Take some advice from Brittany Burgett at Haven Life. Help yourself first. You won't be able to take care of anyone if you aren't in good health and good financial shape. Second, take a lesson from Maury Teherapur. The key to successful negotiating? Well, it lies in building relationships to find solutions that'll benefit everyone. But the big takeaway? Who thought Joe and OG would be low enough to bring in a ringer? As soon as Joe's mom walked into the dining room, she put the kibosh on everything. But just like Maury said, in the spirit of meeting me halfway, she did agree that I can now take out the trash every day. I'll tell you what, Joe's mom knows all about win-win. Special thanks to Maury Teherapur for stopping by the basement. You can find out more about Maury and her book, Bring Yourself, at MauryTaharapur.com. And since you don't have a chance in hell of spelling her name correctly, you should check her out on our show notes page at StackingBenjamins.com. Thanks also to Brittany Burgett from Haven Life for joining us today. You'll find a link to the Sandwich Generation study in our show notes at StackingBenjamins.com. This show is created by Joe Saul Seahide, produced by Richie Rudder Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I just jumped the shark. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. 
That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor. Margie down at the Sizzler just told me I made something of a Freudian slip. When I asked her what that was, she said it's when you say one thing, but you really mean your mother. Welcome to the after show. Were you talking about something going on with your family? No, I asked you if you watched in Homeland. Yes, Homeland. Have, have you watched any of it? I ever? have never watched any of it. You and Cheryl would love this program. Why? Because we're communists? It has nothing to do with communism. Oh, that's the other one. What's the other one where the people are really Russian spies? It's on FX. I know what you're talking about. What's American name? something or Russell. Another. Yeah. No, no. Homeland with. Claire Danes and, and, uh, and Mandy Patankin. Yeah, and what's his name from uh, Band of Brothers? Mm, I don't know. The red-haired guy who was on Billions, right? Yeah, he he has a part in the earlier ep- uh, seasons. <laughs> they're they're on season eight now, so you've got a ways to go. But I just watched season seven. I didn't realize I was behind on season seven. What's it on? It's on Showtime. It's ten bucks, dude. I finally just got access. Stimulate the economy. <laughs> So I now have added HBO Go, and I've added, no, <laughs> and, I and, and I've added Disney. I told you this was going to happen. I've added and Disney now there's Plus. Gonna come, there's going to be a guy that comes around and goes, "Wait a second, guys, let me get this. Let me let me help you out with this. Oh. We put this all together in the- one package." For the low, low price of ninety nine ninety nine, you don't have to all these subscriptions. No, just what? See, here's the thing: it's perfect timing. Here's why. Of course, you bring up though, but before we get to that, you bring up a damn show on the one subscription I don't yet have. Okay, I yeah. don't have the CBS All Access either. Well, that's just stupid. So Not watching. Well, Picard fans, mail your uh, mail your hate mail to OG at stackingbenjamins.com. Let me make my case. Today is April the twentieth. Dude, dude, sweet. What's mine say? Sweet. What's mine say? Dude. <laughs> What's mine say? Sweet. (laughs) What's mine say? Dude. So today's April the 20th. There are eight seasons of Homeland and 12 hours per season of content. I guarantee that there's no way that you can just watch one episode at a time. You're talking about how you're like, I'm just going to watch another episode. This is that. This is, if you, did you like 24? Yes. This is like 24. It's like every, you're just, you're, it ends and you go, I, I just got to watch the next one. I just, this next one, it's two in the morning, but I got to watch the next one. So you watch all this and then you can transition your subscription into billions, which is starting May the 3rd, the new season. So you could go right through all the homelands. Then we'll go into the billions. By the time you get done with the billions, then you, you'll be into the final or the next season of billions. I think they're on season four of billions. I think I told you, I saw just the first two episodes of billions on a plane. Yeah, it's amazing. The and, writing is and I, unbelievable. And I wanted to watch more of that. Immediately it's, want to watch more of that. Well, both of these shows have just fantastic actors and actresses in them. I mean, Mandy Patinkin is Inigo Montoya from You, you Killed know, My Princess Father. Bride. He's fantastic. Have, have you seen interviews with him? Yes, he was on 60 Minutes the other day. And they were talking about this, you know, like how do you make this show? So season seven, which is what I just get done watching is all about Russian hackers. I'm not giving anything away. You watch it and you go, this has happened before or is happening presently. I'm 1000% sure of it. You know what I mean? Like you go, this is diabolical and I totally get it. 
how much of it is true, some of it's sensationalized, but they go through like how this is kind of working. And, you know, there's some digs at the current thing, you know, the current time, so to speak. There's a scene where they're interviewing the uh, or two, or two Russian diplomats or whatever are talking, and uh, one is doing something bad and one doesn't know the other person's doing something bad. And he's like, you know, well, well, we can't be doing this. And he's like, yeah, especially after after we got our hand caught with our hand in the cookie jar with their elections in the last cycle, you know, so they, they put a little, you know, a little stank on it. Yeah. Like, Hey, you yeah. Know. But man, it's so good. It's so good. It follows a very formulaic theme. Just trouble. Savior stop. fixes the problem. Stop. Ends up taking one for the team. Stop. You know, no, I'm just saying like, I, that's I know. the pattern. I'm, I'm, I'm handing you my freaking wallet. Just stop. Please. Stop. The good news is, is that you can get all this done in two months. This is what I was going to say between now and before it resubscribes you for a third month, you can have all of this done. Showtime. And there's probably some free month, one free month deal out there. Yeah, you just get it 1099. It's on your phone. There's got to be. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> dude, you got a tattoo. <laughs> so what did you do? No. <laughs> Oh, dude, what does my tattoo say? Sweet! <laughs> what about mine? Dude, what does mine say? <laughs> Sweet! <laughs> what about mine? Dude, what does mine say? Sweet! <laughs> what about mine? Dude, what does mine say? <laughs> Sweet! What about mine? Dude, what does mine say? Sweet! What about mine? Dude, what does mine say? Sweet! What about mine? Dude! What does mine say? Sweet! Sweet! Idiot! Nick, while only come to Jango's hands,